Depression is one of the leading causes of disability in the world. It's estimated that about one in four people suffer from depression at some point in their lives. But because it's a mental illness, it's sometimes hard to kind of understand it in the same way that you would a physical problem like blood pressure or cholesterol. One of the things that sometimes is confusing as well is that um, people often don't distinguish between what feeling depressed looks like and what having depression looks like. So it's normal for all of us to feel depressed at some point in our lives. A job loss, a, a, a break in a relationship, a big change in your life, or sometimes it can just come out of the blue. But usually, when circumstances change, that mood lifts and people start to feel a little bit better. Clinical depression, on the other hand, is different. It's a recognized medical condition and it doesn't really just go away if you want it to. Symptoms usually last for about two weeks consecutively but can last a lot longer. And they range from things like poor appetite, having difficulty sleeping, feeling bad about yourself or that you've let somebody down, um, feeling worthless, trouble concentrating on things. And some of the more kind of worrying symptoms that people get from depression is feeling that they might be better off dead. The causes of depression can vary. It seems to be a complex interplay between genes, the environment, and sometimes a little bit of a biological imbalance in your brain as well. So depression can be hereditary, so it can run in the family. Certain environmental factors like um, a big significant change in your life, um, suffering from a chronic illness that's very difficult to cope with. Um, all of these life circumstances can lead to you maybe kind of looking at the world slightly differently, maybe having more self-critical thoughts about yourself or, um, or others as well. My name is Jo and I'm 58, almost. <laughs> I had a, a, a quite a serious episode of depression when I finished a PGCE, so it was a really intensive year. I did that when I was just 50, and uh, I think I realised at the end of it that I was becoming quite poorly. I think it was just the relentlessness of it, you know, studying and then you were going to placements and you were being critiqued all the time, and that was really hard. I realised I was just very anxious all the time. I couldn't sleep, so I would go to bed, but I, I didn't sleep, so I was awake quite early uh, and awake in the night, and I started to feel, um, uh, when I went to eat, I, I, I was uh, feeling sick all the time, so my appetite reduced a lot, and I lost about a stone and a half in a month, so quite rapid sort of weight loss. Um, and I was just anxious, I wasn't listening to my family, uh, and I was never concentrating on anything, I wasn't motivated, so anything I did I felt very, um, it, I was just doing it automatically, so it was just all those symptoms really of anxiety. I think it was just the, about the last week of the course uh, of my placement I just went to my GP and I just said I don't want to go back and he said actually you don't have to and he started me on antidepressants but he also recommended talking space and that's how I accessed it really and uh, I referred myself that was yeah what he asked me to do so I did. I think it was called Citalopram I think it probably kicked in within about a month or six weeks, so it did take a little while and I was anxious about taking it, but I knew I felt so desperate that I had to do something. And then I took it for a year and then I just felt I wanted to try and manage without it. And I, and I was nervous, but I gradually reduced it on his recommendation and then I stopped and I, and I managed without it. But I think if I hadn't had that, it was essential to take it really, yeah, yeah, to help me through, yeah. Uh, I did, I think it was called Beating the Blues, which was excellent, that was an online sort of course, and then I also went to see somebody, so he would back up what I had um, learnt on the uh, Beating the Blues, and then I went to, to see him, and that was, that was great actually, I learnt a lot an awful lot. I think it was really helpful him talking about looking at a situation and seeing it in a different way which was really helpful 
and also talking about looking after yourself as well and um, because I just stopped seeing people and I'd stopped going places and he said you have you have to do that you have to have a treat you know or even just a walk or a swim you have to do something and at first it might not feel very exciting or interesting you might not be engaged but eventually and that was absolutely true I think yeah definitely to take you back because you were afraid of seeing people because you just felt so rubbish really so yeah I think it was good to think about the way you you thought about um, situations and um, yes I think that was very very helpful and actually um, I have had uh, counselling since then through Talking Space again a different form of counselling and that was really reassuring because we were going through a difficult time um, and the therapist or the counsellor was very much saying I think you've put strategies in place and that was reassuring that I think the things I'd learnt the first time I had had uh, counselling I realised I had put them in place so I was protecting myself and I was looking after myself a lot better so that was really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Because you cannot see depression it's sometimes hard to know what to do about it but it's important to realise that depression is not a life sentence and something can be done about it. There are various effective treatments available that can help you manage these symptoms. Cognitive behavioural therapy is one of these. So I think for depression we know that people change not just the way that they're thinking but also the things that they're doing and how they spend their time. So CBT is really great with focusing on both of those areas. We look at making gradual changes to what people are doing with their time um, in a collaborative way but also thought processes. A lot of what happens with CBT isn't just in the therapy room, it's what we can do outside of therapy. So there might be strategies in place, for example, um, reintroducing enjoyable activities, which is something that can feel really difficult. We would work in a collaborative way to do that. The great thing about CBT is that it helps people to develop their own strategies, so not just helping them to relieve their symptoms whilst they're feeling depressed, but also helping them to keep feeling well once they start to feel better. If you are suffering from relationship distress, which causes low mood, behavioural couples therapy is also another proven treatment to help combat the symptoms of depression. What is behavioural couples therapy? It's for couples who are in a committed relationship, but one of them, or actually sometimes both of them, have been diagnosed with depression. So what we're trying to do is look at what the effect the depression has on the distressed relationship, They'll usually come in with a distressed relationship and also what effect the distressed relationship has on the depression. Um, we're very active so we, when couples come into us they're usually at a pretty low ebb and they're possibly worried about what's going to happen to the relationship, particularly the person who's depressed but quite often the other one as well, worried, feeling helpless. So what we do is we look at the communication and we see if there's any improvement that we can make there and it's all working together like in a triangle with the three of us. Um, then we look at managing the feelings, getting an understanding really of what depression is and what its effects are. And then we look at changing behaviour. It's quite simple and it will be a tiny change and then that will build up to more changes. Now quite often in a relationship where someone's depressed, the other person, without meaning to, totally inadvertently, will start to maintain that depression. They'll start doing things for them, oh that won't make them happy, I'll do that for them. And that is not really helping in the couple relationship or where you are. So we try to manage that. We try to let them see that there's other ways to help and support without maintaining that depression. And I think the main thing that they learn when they come in at a low ebb usually is that this doesn't have to be a life sentence. They can help each other, they can come through it. And that, you know, I'll just give a tiny little statistic, but behavioural couples therapy has a really good high rate of success rather than just going for plain old couples therapy, which has its place, or for treatment for depression. And the success rate is that they don't often relapse. There's a much less chance of them relapsing because they've kind of got a bag of tools to take with them that if something comes along that can re-stimulate them a bit, oh dear, no, that's making me feel a bit low again. They've got things to do, they can talk about it together, they can manage forward. And I think that's what's the most exciting thing for them. They usually come out after their first session feeling, oh, there's hope. 
Mindfulness is another way in which you can manage symptoms of depression and it's especially proven to be helpful for people who are suffering from recurrent depression. So mindfulness was developed as a relapse management treatment. So for people who have experienced depression in the past, it, learning mindfulness helps them to stay well after depression. And what we know is that everybody has a particular pattern of responding to stress and that for some people, especially those who've been depressed before, they can um, revert to negative thinking which can then lead to a whole range of experiences which involves pushing away things that they don't like, avoiding them and trying to hang on to anything which they think are good. So we um, help people to learn patterns of their mind and that um, helps them to stay well after depression. The way in which you relate to other people can sometimes also contribute to depression. Interpersonal therapy helps you understand some of their dynamics and gives you skills and techniques on how you can manage that better. Depression will often occur in what we call a, an interpersonal context and what that means is um, a number of things which contribute to someone becoming vulnerable for depression but what will often push them into that is maybe a, a significant event like a change in job, uh, becoming a parent, a health condition, it could be following the loss of someone significant, it could also be something like uh, having a conflict or a dispute in an important relationship. What we do know is that once someone becomes depressed, often what will happen is we'll start to, uh, the relationships with people around us will start to get worse as well. We may not be accessing the support like we normally would. So interpersonal therapy or IPT really focuses in on what that initial trigger was for the depression to start uh, and helping to try to resolve that, but also really looking at rebuilding or building up our support networks around us um, with a view that that will help us to recover from that depressive episode but what we also know is that it's a great way of keeping well once we're out of that depression as well. So that's essentially IPT in a nutshell. We focus a lot on things like communication, um, looking at kind of problem solving strategies, a lot of things around what we can do with other people and how we can really use our network around us. Many people find that counselling is another effective form of treatment. We deliver person-centred experiential counselling for depression, or CFD for short. It's a one-to-one -one form of counselling um, and it's very client-centred, so it's really all about you and the counsellor working together to create a safe space um, for you to talk through your feelings, your experiences and your difficulties in a really fluid, unstructured way, kind of exploring together. It's really collaborative. Um, and hopefully through that exploration, with a real kind of focus on, on the feelings aspects of things, um, kind of deepen your understanding of things and find some ways forward together. For someone with depression, taking those first steps to seek out help can feel like an insurmountable task. We've made it as easy as possible for you to do that by simply going to your GP, asking for a referral, or you can refer yourself. Sometimes it's difficult to talk to your family or your friends. You don't want to burden them. You don't want to put that responsibility on their shoulders. And, and why should you? I think just having a professional person to talk to is fantastic, actually. It's quite a, a privilege to, to have that opportunity, really, just to talk through things and say, how am I doing? Or I know I did that wrong, but how could I improve? Or how could I do that better so that next time I don't feel so uncomfortable about it all? So that was really fantastic, yeah. It was such a dreadful feeling, it was such a hopeless feeling, a, this black hole, it was just so frightening. It was very frightening, but I got better and that, that was wonderful, but that, you have to get the help. You, and it's hard when you feel that depressed, it's very hard to seek help, but, but and now I realise if I'm feeling unwell, I never want to go back there again because it is such a frightening situation. But there is hope and there is, you know, there is help out there, definitely, yeah.